It's okay. It's fine. Our first speaker is Stefania Pandolfo. Stefania Pandolfo was born in Italy, but has lived and worked in Morocco for many years. She is a professor of anthropology and a member of the programs in critical theory and medical anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. Her work centers on subjectivity, imagination, trauma, and the experience of madness with a focus on the Maghreb, and in conversation with psychoanalysis and Islamic thought on the intersections and counterpoints of the psyche and the soul in human and other histories. She is the author of Not of the Soul, Madness, Psychoanalysis, Islam, published in 2018, and Impasse of the Angels, Scenes from Moroccan Space of Memory, published in 1997, and co-author with Anne Lovell, Vina Das, and Sandra Lagier of Face au Désastre, Une Conversation en Quatre Fois sur la Folie, la Coeur et le Grand des Tresses Collectif, published in 2013. She is currently working on a book about aesthetic experience, violence, and psychic pain, based on her ethnography and on collaborations with a number of artists. She guest curated Matrix 274, a contemporary art exhibition at the Berkeley Art Museum. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Stefania Pandolfo. And thank you everybody for coming. I know that there is a, a town hall with students on campus and uh, it's very kind for you to have come nonetheless. And I want to thank the Sheikh Zaid Chair for Arabic and Islamic Studies at the UB and Bilal Orfeli and Salim al Bahluli and Aida Abbas for making this possible in this moment of great uncertainty and sorrow. We chose this title regarding the burning, uh, the, one of the founding members of Abu Nadara and I, uh, to capture something shared in the questions that animate our otherwise very different work and to establish the terms of a dialogue. In our two parts, each in our own way, we will reflect on an effort to capture moments of shattering what we call burning also, in their destructive and their creative capacity, and the instability from which emerges a vision, seeking a form, an expression, which is also a counter image to approach what is beyond words. As an anthropologist, I encountered the burning uh, which is the way I translate al harg in, in Arabic, in Maghribi Arabic, uh, as a term and a concept in my work in Morocco. The youth with whom I talked spent their nights on a hill overlooking the freeway to Tangiers, the way to Spain, gazing at the horizon and cultivating their vision of a crossing, which was much more than an attempt, a muhawala as they also called it, at undocumented migration in the back of a truck or in a boat across the water. They spoke of harg, literally the burning, as a passion, a longing, echoing the vocabulary of love and of folly. The word itself, l'harg, l'harg, l'harik, evoked a trespassing the way one can burn a red light or transgress a prohibition or a ban, and by that act, undoing the border itself. Burning was also the incineration of identity. The identity papers by which one is identified by the border police and sent back, but also the stereotype, but, but also the way one is stereotyped through one identity. And it was the undoing of the inner violence, a violent gaze from within, that prevented one from leaving. It was the risk one was willing to take one had to take as both a confrontation with death and a promise of life. On that expanded border, in the counter image of burning, there was a passage to other times and other possible worlds. The paper, and this was something that Sharif and I kind of conceived together, and now I go to my part of the presentation and then we will move on to the second part that will have an introduction 
by Abu Nadara and then a screening of the films. And afterwards, we will have a conversation between us and with all of you, hopefully. The paper I'm presenting today is grounded in my long-term ethnographic work in Morocco on the experience of psychic suffering and the multiple sites of the cure. From the Al Razi, Al -Razi uh, Psychiatric Hospital and Mental School of, uh, Medical School of Psychiatry in Saleh, Morocco, where I conducted research for, with patients, psychiatrists, and psychoanalysts in the early years 2000, and all the way to today to some extent, to the sites of religious cures of madness and the jinn, and of chronic healing all the way to the present. Some of this work is published in my book, Not of the Soul, Madness, Psychoanalysis, Islam, which is written in the form of cases, scenes, and dialogues through the specificity of encounters with the women and men I met at the hospital and outside of the hospital in their homes, with psychiatrists and psychoanalysts with whom I discussed their approach to psychic suffering, to the psyche, to the unconscious, and to the cure, and with Quranic scholars and therapists, one in particular, who practices the liturgy of the Ruqiya, a recital of the Quran on behalf of the soul, with whom I met his patients, and I was present with them in the ritual scene, while also learning from him about the medicine and sciences of the soul, tadib al-nafs, and al-mujahada nafsiya, the struggle of the soul, in our exchanges and through the texts that inform this thinking and practice. I will develop here something I did not explicitly elaborate in my book concerning the blurred border of vision and illness as unconscious work of form, born in the midst of crisis, psychical, mystical, political, as a force of expression and of the painful creative imagination. And I will ponder the impossible yet necessary encounter between psychoanalysis and Islamic spiritual medicine. At the center of my presentation is the question of translation, the decentering of European concepts, but also what I consider a radicalization of psychoanalysis itself in a direction that is for me inspired by the clinical and political work of Franz Fanon. It is a question that summons me in terms of my own work with and against psychoanalysis in the contemporary Maghreb and in the missed, displaced, and yet effective encounter of psychoanalysis and the Islamic tradition. At issue is a postcolonial migration of concepts, but also an original implication of the concept of the unconscious in the life of the soul. Taking the heteronomy of the unconscious into account which undoes all accounts, is at once a potentiality and a risk, one of the possible ways to the encounter the paradoxical knowledge of the afterlife. So one expression, tabir, the intermediate world. world. An improbable garden perched on top of a roof in a low-income neighborhood in Rabat, Morocco. In one of the oldest informal extensions of the city, built in the 1960s, on the side of argillous and barren hills and overlooking swampy flatlands, built partly as shanty towns that were consolidated with durable materials, in keeping with the layout of old settlements, a space grabbed but the utterly poor as an ungranted right to have a home. For many who live here, there is a history of migration from the rural interland. People live in villages in periods of drought or just to seek work and a new life in the city. Recently, the Sub-Saharan Africans halted in their crossing to Europe by the new impassable borders and parked here in indeterminate waiting caught in a suspended journey between two continents and subjected to increasing racism, just as many Moroccan youth from the same and many other neighborhoods longing to make that crossing. Families have been dismembered and reassembled, 
buildings have grown on top of each other to welcome newborns and newcomers, producing an intricate grid of ever unfinished concrete buildings. The garden, Ilias's garden, springs as a miracle in a hostile environment, such a germination of cement itself. A dream sprang from the materiality of confinement and becomes a paradoxical site of sanctuary. It is in this neighborhood that back in the early 2000, when I was doing field work on what in the Maghreb is known as Al Harg, the burning, the event and the project of burning borders, I met a group of young men and spent time with them, listening to their accounts of physical and spiritual confinement, the suffocation which led them to risk their lives in the attempt at crossing the Mediterranean, listening to their lucid analysis of the historical present and to their dreams. One of them introduced me to Elias and his partner, Samia. There was a secret resonance between the youth project of burning, which far exceeded the simple quest for material and economic gain, to use the language, the official language of the discourse of migration, and Ilias's suspended garden and his paintings. The youth knew when they spoke of Harg, um, the, new, the youth knew this when they spoke of Harg as an irrepressible longing and a vital need. They looked at Ilias as a visionary, sometimes seized by his halat, his mad states, but himself moved by a longing and a vital need that expressed itself in his paintings and his garden. At times they asked him for images. I remember a cyber cafe, an internet cafe, whose metal door had been illuminated by Ilias's painting of a mythical bird the invocation of an elsewhere in the confined space of the neighborhood. Ten years after our first encounter, ten years during which we spent time together talking about his paintings and what Ilias called humum hayat, the anguish and the torments of life, I went to their home one day to ask permission to publish the images of his paintings in my book. The images were my photos of Ilias's murals and other paintings that by then only existed in my digital archive and in the prints that I had given him. For the paintings themselves had been erased, or more precisely covered by a thick layer of white paint, by Ilias himself in the aftermath of his episode of illness. There was above all the mural fresco of the serpent an immense and, overwhel and over overwhelming the viewer, painted in dark blue, black, and teal colors, which back then when I met Ilias covered the entire length of a wall in the single room which was their home. And there was the mural painting of uh, the mermaid, Arusat al-Bahar, the bride of the sea, repeated on the walls in many shapes and versions a Maghribi mythical image of watery metamorphosis, desire and demonic sexuality, which here took the intimate connotation of a secret vital energy. And there were the arcades and the columns uh, inspired by the Arab architecture of traditional homes, but painted here as a support to another scene, and I take this expression from Freud, the other scene that unfolded in this very space and in the midst of everyday life. And there were the paintings Ilias made on whatever material he could find, cardboard or plywood, among them his self-portraits, one resembling Van Gogh, and the other a green melancholy, portraits in a prison, in a prison cell. And the set of small paintings he made during the troubled times, inner and outer, which he described as paintings of a state, lohat lifihim hala, images that contained or encoded the pathos of a crisis, a psychic and a spiritual state. This included what he called her snake, which he made in 2009, at a time when Samia was drifting into an episode of illness and he felt himself vulnerable to a relapse. 
The suspended garden on the roof is the counterpoint to another garden, which years ago, at the time of the mural of the, of the, mural of the serpent, was painted on the front door of their house. The Lost Garden. The door painting shows a tree with two human personages, reminiscent of the Quranic story of Adam and Hawa, and their expulsion from the garden. It is, it's the two of us, Samia told me the first time we walked through the door. A roughly sketched human figure stretches an arm upward to pick a fruit that lies beyond its reach. It is a posture of disablement. Another figure, with his back turned to the other, offers an empty hand to the viewer. Stretching out one's hand, Ilias says, is the gesture of the beggar. Later, he explained the circumstances in which the painting had come into being. He was trapped in his illness, unable to provide for the necessities of their life. The painting shows Samia hungry and unable to reach, and himself is back turned, empty-handed. He calls this image Shajarat al-Hayat, the tree of life. One afternoon in 2005, while completing the whitewashing of his home, Elias asked me whether I would, have, I would like to have the door so that I could keep and care for it in my place. By then we had had so many conversations about these images, his visions, his hala, and his paintings. He was ambivalent about destroying the door. It stored the cipher of his relationship and life with Samia. But he knew that he could not start living again in a space populated by these witnesses of the world of his illness traces of a burning exposure. He needed a new door. I proposed to buy it, but he said that such paintings, the paintings that contain a hala, a state, could not be sold. We arranged for a small truck to transport the door to my place, where it still is today on consignment, or rather as an amana, something entrusted to a temporary caretaker. The recordings of our conversations over the years are punctuated by birds singing, the passing birds that visited the roof garden and the ones that shared their life just outside their home. Birds inhabit the paintings as well, flying, perched, imprisoned. At a closer look though, the birds uh, are metamorphic being, the inhabitants of an intermediate world beings of feathers and scales between the water, the earth, and the sky, being sama wal ard, between the sky and the earth, and between the different forms of creaturely life, plants and animals, humans and jinn, between the visible and the invisible. When it was still visible on the walls of their home, the serpent had horns like a dragon, scales like a fish, and brandished a sword. Oh. Oh, sorry. Alongside the sword, an Arabic inscri inscription read, La Ghaliba illa Allah. No one is victorious except for God. An invocation of divine power resonant of Ayat al-Kursi, the verse of the throne, and Surat al-Mulk, the chapter of divine rule in the Quran. And yet suspended between agony and salvation with a knife dug into its back, the serpent was an injured and tormented body and soul. It was a contradictory image, charged with pathos and full of tension, which Elias says to have painted in one session, Bila Shuor, without consciousness, from the bottom of his pain and in the altered state of his hala. State, condition, altered state, but also a medical case. Other prominent iconographic elements include the three crosses drawn in the style of a Christian crucifixion on top, 
a disconnected arm holding a key with chains to the right, the recur recurrent motif of an eye, and surrounding water and waves, the sea. The snake is the, quote, the snake is the illness of a person, to aban al mard dil shakhs, he says, and the illness too is a torment, adab, a divine trial, an ibtila, like the trial of the grave in Islamic eschatological imagination, so much pain and torture a human being is made to endure by the illness, he says. The serpent, Ilyas explained, had materialized on its own, buhdu. It was the result of a shattering, as if the torment had taken a visible form outside of him and without knowledge. The images staged themselves, he says, like a corrugation on the face of the earth, during an earthquake. They are an effect of, quote, the things that were agitating inside me. As far as he could remember, he felt an urge and a mounting tension before painting. He emphasizes the rift, the inadequacy of his account. He was not the same person then. He painted besides himself, driven by a powerful urge, and the shapes, ashkal, emerged ready-made from the inner upheaval. Quote, the painting happens outside of consciousness, bilash or. It comes without a plan, chaotically, impulsively. I paint what is inside, all that is agitating inside. The figure had emerged on their own. He says, can hatum fisora. I put them down in the picture, as one downloads a heavy current. He was not here, he was not there to compose the painting. The image came out already composed. Quote, like something that was already there, he says, present and manifested itself. He smiles. Quote, it works even without consciousness. And he laughs. In Moroccan Arabic. There existed a whole world there, live, powerful forces in those colors and shapes. Have they really withdrawn? But he jokes, the serpent is confined to the wall now. In a few days, when I'm done whitewashing, it will disappear altogether. I no longer have the snake here, pointing to his head. Bilashur is a term that keeps returning in our conversation without consciousness and takes in Ilyas's language the status of a concept. From the verb sha'ara, to be conscious, to be aware, but in the sense of intuitive, and intuitive understanding, in the sense of poetic inspiration, Ilyas's use of the phrase resonates at once with the theological question of divine disclosure and the human incapacity to acquire knowledge of al-ghaib, the realm of the non-manifest, and with la shor in the sense of the unconscious, the realm of passions and concealed meanings, as in, psych in the psychoanalytic concept of the unconscious, al shor or al why in psychoanalytic literature in Arabic, significantly the term al shor for grounds from grounded in the mystical writing of Ibn Arabi. Um, was foregrounded to refer to the incomm incommensurability and alterity of God, and it was chosen as an Arabic translation of the Freudian concept of the unconscious uh, in um, late 19th century and early 20th century Egypt. Only later, and this for me leads, and we can talk about this in the discussion if you want, but to a question of comparison that is not just comparison, but that I see as a radicalization of what does it mean to think about the unconscious in psychoanalysis and in general in what is understood as psychology and what would it mean to take seriously uh, experiences of altered states or somewhat prophetic experiences, even though for Ilias this is not a prophetic experience as I will discuss, uh, but experiences according to which the state that is without consciousness is a state in which something comes from the outside, from elsewhere. And in what sense this is something that Freud himself was attempting to, to, to encounter without having 
a language to be able to speak about it. Only later, after the Hala has receded, Elias deciphered these paintings and explicates their ashkal and their ta'abir, their shapes and their symbolic figures, bridges and crossings between incommensurable realms, this world and the other, the visible and the invisible. This is how Elias interpreted for us the painting of the serpent, for us, for me and Samia. And maybe for us, but it was for me and Samia. Before covering it up with a heavy coat of whitewash. If we want to explicate the painting, Loha, there is the serpent, it is the torment, the torment of life, humum hayat, Life when it's hard, when it's painful, is like a serpent. It is poisonous. As for the sword, the sword, safe, is the force that conquers all things. Next to the sword, he, referring to himself, the painter, wrote in Arabic, La ghaliba illallah, no one is victorious except God, because God, praise and glory on him, only God is sovereign on all things. For all that happens in the life of creatures, all that human, uh, all that um, all the human beings suffer and, and endure, their successes and their failures happen with the permission of God. And over there, pointing to the right side of the painting, there is a key. It is the figure of imprisonment, shakal sijin, the form of a human being imprisoned in life. Masjun fil hayat. Because the life of a person without works, amal, without aim and without fulfillment is the life of a person in prison. This much is made visible, expressed in the painting. That is the tabir, that is, that is the, the, the expression or symbolization, the figures that are present in the painting. For Elias, four figures, and he uses the word aibarat or ashkal in talking, recapitulate the scene, the serpent, which is the torment of life, the sword, the image of divine power that conquers and saves, but also, Elias says, the sword is jihad, is effort and is harb, war, with the illness and with the hardship of our time. Jihad wal harb mal mord wal waqt. He says in Moroccan Arabic. The writing, Kitaba, that, procre that proclaims God's rule on all things and reminds human beings of their vulnerability, and the key and the chains that evoke the prison of life. The figures are not symbolic in the conventional sense of representation that stands for other things, whether objects or ideas. Their nature is khayali, it's imaginal. They are manifestations, at once a screen and a bridge to what they make visible. Such is the force of the operation of tabir, what, what Ilias calls the operation of tabir, the operation of expression. From the semantic root abara, which connotes the crossing of a river, for instance, between places and world distant, worlds distant and incommensurable, which can only be connected by the action of an intermediate term charged with pathos, expressions and shapes, aibarat and ashkal, in the specific, the specific vocabulary of Ilias, inspired by the ontology of Muslim mysticism. The emphasis on this on the torment of the soul, a state of things that Ilya suggests is the outcome of a specific historical condition, that of a society built on dispossession and where human beings are abandoned to wander and waste away. Empty handed as in the painting of the tree. The serpent, the illness, is not just an existential condition and a theological dilemma. It is also that very historical prison. The theological question of suffering through the experience of madness takes on a political meaning, one which is at once intimate and collective. A painting from this period expresses this sentiment through the image, Ilias says, the form, shakal, 
of a head faceless and empty inside, held in the hands of a woman, the posture of disarray and despair. With the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem suspended in its cavity, with its golden dome and its colonnade, and a barbed wire crowning, uh, crowning it uh, like a crown of thorns. Al-Aqsa is a recurrent theme in, theme in his paintings, where the torment of Palestine and with the historical realities marked by injustice and political violence in Morocco as well, resonate with the torment of the person, of the soul, and the psyche. And there is even a small sculptural model of Al-Aqsa that is installed on a wall on his roof garden. You no, sorry. You can see it here, I can't magnify it, but it's right at the right inside. It's actually an, an object, it's a little uh, maquette that is put there, and, uh, and there is a painting of the neighborhood there. That um, it is as if Al-Aqsa has actually withdrawn or found refuge in his garden. Um, the empty cavity The empty cavity of the head is painted in blue and alludes at once to the void of a loss and to a cosmic space, a space that is Samawi. We see the mosque withdrawing and recognize, and recognize the outline of a tortured body depicted by a bloody scarf which evokes the shape of a map of Palestine. al is our obsession, it is murdered, he suggests, and withdrawn, and withdraws pushed by the wind of occupation. Elias painted this picture when Samia was ill. The head held by the feminine hands is Samia's. The inside and the outside, the register of history and that of the psyche are entangled. If around the faceless head, the world disappears, the violence of history carves our empty heads and makes the world withdraw. So, he also showed me another painting uh, about the empty head, which is this is the image of a psychotic episode in his, uh, in his, um, in his depiction, in which uh, the world has become completely confused around the head that is no longer there. Luhat Lifihim Hala, painting of a state. Those paintings are made in an altered psychological state. There are pictures that contain a hala, Lohat lifihim hala, he says. Hala is the common no medical term for a psychopathological state. It is used in the context of mental illness as well as the cures of the jinn, where it designates the event of possession, or more specifically, the event of the manifestation of the invisible. From the verb, verbal root hawala, Hala is a term of time and being, a conscious change and transformation, movement and passage between states. The related term Hal designates a non-pathological altered state, altered state in Sufi-inspired practices, and in this sense it is related to the term Wajad, the presencing, presence, which in the context of liturgy and ritual refers to trance. Lohali fi Hala, as for Elias, the status of a concept. He designates a particular kind of efficacious image, a pathological image, which can become an agent of transformation. The picture that contains a state is an image that stores an affect and contains an invisible presence. In the case of her serpent, which Elias painted when Samia was ill, and where uh, this is the case of her serpent, which he painted when, she, when Samia was ill, and where he represents himself in a house ablaze and drowning in the sea, wanting to take his own life. Or the case of the self-portrait, where he represents himself in a prison cell, the posture of despair, but also the prison of the neighborhood. Um, sorry. Also, an image of the neighborhood, uh, which is known in Morocco to be a place where the police only enters when they're doing raffles. So, um, so is this haunting by a jinn? Ilias does not say. 
He limits himself to that ambiguous vocabulary of the hala, the state, and to the medical language of illness. Yet Samia reminds him of the female jinn who were dancing on the walls in their apartment at night. And it just mentions to me the paintings of Abbas Saladi, today at the National Gallery in Rabat, a painter whose talent as an artist was recognized well after his death, after a life spent in poverty, marked by periods of psychiatric internment. Saladi was a painter of jinn, Kir Simil Jin, he tells me. Like his own, Saladi's paintings were populated by invisible presences and by mythological creatures drawn from an ancient and a collective memory. The picture they, con they contain a state opens an interval, which is a bridge to another modality of being, where a kind of witnessing becomes possible. This has direct resonance with an Islamic tradition of the image that is directly implied by Ilyas's choice of terms. The efficacious character of these images, and more general of the operation that he calls tabir, expression, visualization, can be related to the ontological intercession of images in the space of the limit that Mohiddin ibn Arabi had called barzakh, an imaginal border that joins by separating such an isthmus of a bridge, and that is the site of passage for bodies and spirits, a partition, a screen, between two modalities of being, spiritual and corporeal, widening and delimiting this world and the other, the site where the impossible can manifest itself in concrete form. In this sense, the Barzakh of Ilias's painting is a visionary geography that rests at once in the world of material experience, in its historical reality, and on the autonomous ontological status of the images themselves. Ibn Arabi draws the distinctions between the contiguous imagination, uh, al-khayal al-muttasil, as a faculty of the soul, the fact that when I see something, I have an image in my mind, and uh, the discontiguous imagination, al-khayal al-munfasil, whose ex existence is independent of the viewer. The realm of the autonomous imagination is alam al-khayal, the intermediate world of images where divine presence manifests itself as the world. This dimension of imagination cannot be the object of representation and thought. It can only be accessed in the mode of witnessing, mushahada. Even though the analogy is only partly granted, it could be said that Ilias's imaginal visions, the pictures that contain a state, are a form of witnessing in the eclipse of human presence. Once the hala recedes, Ilias says, the paintings that contain a state become unbearable, like a burning exposure, and this is why they must be covered by a thick layer of white paint. And yet throughout the years of our conversations, he has never claimed for himself the place of a Sufi, or even of the inspired Majdub from Jadba, trance, a place which is nonetheless very important in Moroccan cultural and religious history. He kept describing his condition simply as al-mard, the illness, al-mard nefsani, a malady of the soul, or even more prosaically, a mental illness that manifests itself in the hala, the state. He has only been at the hospital once to talk with Samia's psychiatrist, and because of a request. Perhaps this is due to his reserve, which makes him shun any explicit, explicit reference to the experience, experiences that are visualized in his paintings of states. But perhaps it is also due to what I understand as his indifferent acceptance of the vocabulary of modernity, of medicine and psychiatry, encompassing words that pervade our world and that he accepts and ignores at once. And I'm thinking of Kateb Yassin, the Algerian writer who wrote his name by the appellation of the French colonial administration. And in that space of colonial wounding, he was able to invent a poetic writing that mobilized an ancient Arab memory. One that first is writing in French, in watermark. So I actually am not counting time. We should be fast, right? How much time do I have? Like, can I have three minutes? Huh? Okay. So the question that I so I will just now uh, I will move to um, 
very quickly. So there is a question here that we can discuss in the in the in, in the in the question, if you want, that has to do with this refusal of taking a prophetic position, and yet the fact that there, there are references in what he's doing to the idea of the sort of a, an ascent and uh, uh, and uh, and the fact of of, of witnessing um, a, a knowledge that is a knowledge of the limit. And, uh, and we can talk about the Quranic passages that, um, in fact, there was in Surat al um, uh, which is something that he would not refer, and I am putting it as, as a kind of impossible counterpoint. Um, there, is a, there, is a, uh, there is a narrative of the ascension, the ascent, the ascension of the Prophet Muhammad to the seventh sky and to God through the event of the Isra, the journey, and the Mi'araj, the ascension. And uh, it's a story of divine encounter and revelation deeply anchored in the collective memory in Morocco. And, uh, and some of these images are born from this collective imagination, and yet they are also disavowed and, uh, and, and, and always described as an experience of illness. Uh, which I find uh, at the same time fascinating and moving. Um, but let's go back to the painting before I conclude. So the place of God in the painting of the serpent is marked by the shapes of the writing in the key and uh, should be reflected upon. The writing is in the inscription of, of uh, a Quranic utterance, a recitation that is also a divine interruption and a command. In his unconsciousness, the painter knows that the ultimate appeal is in God. But there is no salvation. The serpent and the Quranic writing are not the element and the theme of his delusion, as might be suggested by the language of psychiatry, but they are the terrain and the weapons of a confrontation, a struggle. The struggle happens when Elias's faculty of sensory perception are eclipsed and uh, when existence is exposed beyond all personal life, it happens in an imaginal stage that is also the stage of the soul, the nafs, and which resembles the dramaturgy of the Quranic cure called Ruqiya, a liturgy where the religious therapist recites the Quran over the body of the afflicted. The divine utterance intervenes and descends as an incision that interrupts and opens the space of a struggle. In that struggle, the jinn and the soul, nafs, keep exchanging, exchanging their places and alternating the one and the other as, as, as uh, uh, within the perspective of torture and deliverance. This is not to say that the confrontation in Ilias's painting can be translated into a ritual of depossession, one that he never wanted to seek, but that the ritual of depossession itself the ones that I kind of witnessed many, many times on the stage of the Ruqiyah as performed by a Quranic, a Quranic therapist, uh, um, which is you know, a big part of my book. Uh, but the, but the, the ritual of depossession itself opens onto an imaginal space where the question of being, madness, and divine interruption takes the center stage. So I will not go into this part of my paper, but there is a part of my paper here that goes into the question of the Mujahada Nafsiya as practiced within the context of the cures of uh, the Quranic therapist, and uh, an attempt to compare this to also the question of the drive in psychoanalysis and, uh, and the question of the space of violence from within which the nafs can at the same time purify itself, but it's also always, always at risk. And, um, and this is a question that we can discuss in the, in the debate, if you want, because it has also something to do with the films that we will see later. But I want to conclude uh, going back to Elias and, um, and to a last painting that is very important to me and that, um, and that uh, I name the painting of Zaman Akhar, Another Time, and that he also he calls the painting of the cycle of life. Um, so, 
So I want to return to Elias, uh, this is very short, and it is about prophetic dimensions of his visions. For while the tension of his paintings points, points constantly to the dialectic between an earthly order, a, a, at times painful, violent, and unjust, and another order, a celestial one, Samawi, which is indexed by the other time of divine manifestation and transmutation, and we can think of the painting of the mosque, of al and of the serpent itself, Elias does not claim for himself the status of a prophet, nor does he claim a demiurgic creativity. He does not qualify as gesture, but only uses that ambiguous term, ambiguous terms, al-hala, which stretches between the malady of the soul, the loss of self, hospitalized madness, and the experience of ecstasy. His gesture then is then of the man of his time in dialogue with the youth of his neighborhood, moved by the passion of burning borders. And in this historical time of confinement, suffocation and violence, and of what the Imam, uh, the Faqih with whom I worked and who practices the cures, the, the therapies of, of depossession and, uh, and the Ruqiya, um, and uh, in this time that he formulates as uh, the, the experience of suffocation that he formulates as dikun nafs, the choking of the soul, in this time when artistic expression, tabir, and I put artistic in parentheses, Ilias himself wishes to define himself as a fanan, as an artist, is a question of life and death, a vital need and a, and a risk crossing. Ilias migrates towards another time which he calls literary Zaman Akhar in his own crossings of an intermediate world. It is the time of sanctuary and a horizon of incubation, which is at once a futuristic and liturgical, the time of the garden. In the... In this encounter, which is at once folly and not folly, there is a possibility of mutation in the germination of a new world. I will conclude then on Ilias's painting of Linsan Wal Hayat, or Zaman Akhar, the human being in life in another time, which rehearses such a remote future tense. This painting, I'm quoting him, this painting shows Kedar, human being in their life. From ancient times, human beings, Linsan, plant trees and throw seeds. Here we have a man who is constructing and building cities. Here we have a woman and she's engendering generations. Here the sun, and I visualize him, I visualize the sun as electric light. And this part of the painting visualizes and expresses death. You see the caskets, I showed them as buildings because the city of the dead is a city too. I asked him why the man who is throwing grains and cultivating the land is purple and resembles an alien or a visitor from another galaxy. He replies that he comes from Zaman Akhar, another time, a once ancient and future. And he shows me the eggs, you can see at the bottom, on which they are sitting the woman and the man, mythical characters from which spring both life and death. It is life germinating, it is the new life. The eggs contain the different species and forms of life of the universe, he explains, creatures of the earth and the air, creatures of water, insects, birds and fish. But they're also beings that can transform, metamorphic beings, they're mutants. Kit Baddalu, Kit Haulu, he says, who can shed their skin and renew like the, skin, that like the snake or perhaps like the haraga, like the burners. They are the beings of an intermediate world capable of transforming like the burners who can shed their skin. And they are the invisible, invisible beings, the inhabitants of the garden. Thank you. As Stefania said, there'll uh, be a conversation uh, with Stefania and a spokesperson from Abu Nadara Collective um, after the screening of films. Uh, but we want to give you an opportunity now. Um, 
to ask any questions you might have uh, for Stefania. We'll take about 10 minutes to have a short discussion before moving on to our second speaker. Kirsten? Yeah, four minutes still, but it just strikes me as one looks at this compositionally, the Zaman Akhir, that one is seeing, uh, I don't really know what I'm asking, but I feel like there's a, a set of times that are co-occurring here. And this is something compositionally that um, manuscript illustrations, such as Salim has spoken about, um, they, they built in. You could see multiple scenes, we, we would call them stacked spaces. And there's this, um, you know, art historical claim that manuscript illustration has no connection mm -hmm. to art and expression um, of the post-Ottoman life, right? And I'm not positing any like shared visions or something like that. That, that uh, Elias was looking at other artwork. But I'm struck by the way the space is arranged so that there can be these multiple things that are of different times but are happening in the same space, right? Um, I, it's a, I guess I it's a comment. I think this is very much the case. I mean, Elias said lives in the place of the first picture, so he does not really have access to libraries, but he has access to the books that he can find in the Jotia on the street, right? And in fact, in, he knows about Abbas Saladi, the painter who became famous from books that he found mm -hmm. uh, that way. And he, you know, he seeks knowledge and he sees things, and, uh, but he has, uh, this, this is, uh, you know, this painting was made in 2011 mm -hmm. during the Arab Spring. And it's, uh, it's quite fascinating to me that there is this, this uh, kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, visitation from another time that, uh, that is at the same time an inception, because he sees this as an inception, and, um, and, uh, and it also opens up the space of a cycle. So he, at some level he speaks of it as a cycle of life. You see, you see, I mean, you see signs there at, on the right, and then uh, and you see the same containers in the body of, uh, of the woman. Um, but then the, he's compl obviously, there's something about built space that is really important in his experience, in his paintings. Um, also in the paintings that he has on the, on the, but this is not a painting that contains a hala. This is not one of the paintings that, uh, mm. that are, uh, it's efficacious in a different sense. It's a kind of speculative painting about uh, his experience, which, I mean, my sense, uh, I mean, I was just re-listening to some of my conversation, the recordings and conversations with him, that he's the purple guy. Mm. And that, uh, and that there is something in this, in this position, which is the position of someone who can practice tabir in the sense of both illuminating the manuscript, right, but also moving between worlds and coming from outer worlds. And, uh, and, and this is, you know, there is an imagination that is, that is kind of cosmic. If, you, if we look at the forms of life at the bottom, which he was describing, you see there are, mm -hmm. you know, the insects and this and the fish and the animals, and they're brought in those eggs, and, uh, and the egg is also a theme that uh, they sort of, uh, we find it even in the painting of Al-Aqsa, there is a, mm -hmm. an egg, right? So there is, that is the question of germination. Um, we we'll, let's talk more about this after. But I, um, yeah. I'm fascinating. But, but fascinated by this painting and the embracing of the modernness, right? So, mm -hmm. like the sun is a street light, and uh, is an electric light. You know, there is no. So we have to be able to exist in a world where new life will come from another Cemetery. world, from another time. Mm -hmm. But we are living in a world where the sun is an electric light. Please. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's a really a, a new topic for me to bring uh, Sufi experience and artistic and uh, psychoanalysis together as an anthropologist. I mean, uh, it's something new uh, to bring all these to 
together. Uh, so where is the burning in the, 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 the you said uh, so the question of the so what did, why did we choose the title the burning so the burning what i'm saying what i'm suggesting to say here is that when i in what i've written i've written about the burning in other places and i'm not really i mean this is the same neighborhood where i worked with the young men who have you know made multiple attempts to go across and i was interested in working with them from the perspective of confinement in fact they never made it. If they made it to Spain, they would be sent back by the Spanish police. None of the people with my work ever was able to spend like more than two nights in Spain before being sent back. So there is the burning, this idea of it, it's more really an aspirational horizon. And then it opens the space for another time, which is the time of the burning that is not necessarily of this world. And, uh, and it is an experience that is risky and that is shattering, um, and that I compare in part also because of their, the fact that they're next to each other, um, to the experience of Ilias and his own shattering, as if Ilias was shedding light um, on the sense of the risk taken by the youth in the order of Dunia, if you want, right? And he is actually experiencing this by reflecting on his own experience of madness, from which there is really no exit because he would come in and out of it, he would reflect upon it, it would become the site of, of the attempt, the site of a creation, which it should be considered as a creation, but it was never final, it would always at risk of its own undoing. And, uh, and in fact, it is, I mean, Ilias died in 2021 uh, during one of the COVID lockdowns in Rabat in this neighborhood. and. Uh, and the story was not resolved. Uh, but nonetheless, here I'm trying to see how in that very experience, there, is, there are moments, there are sparks that lead us to be able to encounter his experience as something much more than just an experience of mental illness. So this is what I was trying to say. And the burning is the shattering, but the burning is also the way in which you can look back at the youth or migrate who themselves dream of migrating, who themselves live in other times and sometimes speak of in, in very Quranic theological vocabularies of the crossing as the crossing of Sirat al-Mustaqim, so as the crossing of, uh, of the hour. And they think of the, the way in which they conceive the prison and the, and the confinement uh, as something that should be understood in both political and spiritual terms. Yeah, hi, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, I was curious actually about the Lias's um, um, sort of social relations and maybe social. Uh, re so I was curious if he sort of um, talks about his paintings to these young men you, you were working with or to other people in his communities or. Was that something, sort of a special relationship with you? That it's a special relationship yeah. with me, but his paintings are public. Uh, he's not like, so in this sense, uh, he's different than other people who uh, become painters when they're undergoing experiences of illness, because he wants to see himself as a fanon, even though, and he thinks that, that his experience points to a different way of conceiving art, art as a kind of vital need, art as something that is the capacity to establish a, a connection with another world or an image that will allow us to make a bridge with something else and therefore to give shape, give form to an experience that is otherwise uh, impossible. And, uh, and what is, you know, so in that sense, uh, he communicates with them with his paintings and sometimes as i was saying at the beginning they ask him to illustrate doors in the in the neighborhood and uh, and he does that or they come to ask for his paintings and uh, but it's not necessarily the case that they understand his paintings his paintings there is something that is not completely translatable in his paintings as well and uh, he's the intermediary of this movement yes any other questions? Okay. Um.